Let's talk about some of the key risk metrics related to counterparty credit risk. And we're gonna be looking at an example where we can put in whatever inputs we want for these three metrics. So our inputs are going to be the mean, and in this example, we'll use 5%, the standard deviation of 10%, and then the alpha or confidence level. And for now, I'll just go with 99%. So we're gonna to have to build out some probability distribution of what we would expect for these returns based on this information. So we can start off by picking a percentage that is four standard deviations below the mean. So this is equal to the mean here of C3 minus the standard deviation of 10% times four. So that's 40% below 5%, so negative 35%. And then we can just go up by the previous value, so the negative 35%, and then we can add that standard deviation divided by 10. So really that ends up being 1%. And then we can just shoot that formula all the way down until we are four standard deviations above the mean. So this example right here is 40% above 5%, so four standard deviations above the mean. And then for each of these values or these possible returns that we could have, we can figure out what is the probability that this actually ends up being the annual return for any given year. So we can figure that out by using this formula here, this norm dist, where in this first uh, part for X, we use the annual return in question. Then we put our mean, c3 and then our standard deviation c4 and then we say false for cumulative and then we can take that and divide by 100 and we figure out that you know if the means five percent and the standard deviation is ten percent then 0.001 percent of the time we expect the annual return to be negative 35 percent so now you'll see that if i scroll down i'm going to actually just freeze this right here so if i scroll down you'll see that the highest probability is when we get to our mean, right? Anything, any point we go below this, that percentage starts to decrease. Any point we go above this, that percentage starts to decrease, right? So our mean is the most frequently expected. Then I can plot all these probabilities on a frequency distribution and see this black line is just these probabilities here where at 5%, the mean, we peak, right? And then we have this standard bell curve shape for all the other probabilities. So this line right here, this gray line represents 4% because that is basically where we uh, top out at the mean is around 4% right there. So we have all our possible probabilities. Now let's calculate some of these risk metrics. Now let's start off with expected positive exposure otherwise known as EPE. We can define this as the time average value of expected exposure, focusing only on the positive values of potential future exposures. Now there's a really complicated way to calculate this. So the mathematically most accurate way is to use this formula right here. And you can see I've done that in Excel. So I've re-implemented this formula in Excel. And if you wanna pause your screen or if you're following along at home, you can do it this way. Or you can even download this file for free from the link in the pinned comment or the description. So this formula will end up telling you basically the average of all the, or I should say the weighted average of all of the values in this probability distribution that are greater than zero or positive values. So let me show you in a more intuitive way how this is calculated. So we have all these potential annual returns, right? And then we have found for each annual return, what's the probability that it happens? So one thing I can do is I can do a weighted average of all the positive ones. So I'll do some product. So this is just going to multiply two arrays. So I'll go to where we get to positive, so 1%, and then I will multiply everything with its corresponding probability and then add all of those together. So now I'll grab this array too. So this is gonna take a weighted average based on these probabilities will be the weights of all these annual returns, hit enter. You can see that this is just off by 0.01%. 
It wouldn't be off because we stopped at the fourth standard deviation. If we just kept going down and dragging this down and getting more annual returns, we would take into account even more of those tail events and then these two would match. Now the expected negative exposure is the time average value of the negative potential future exposures. It's typically less relevant in counterparty credit risk as it represents the counterparty's potential gain. So in this case, we do this formula here. So I've re-implemented this formula right here, uh, which you can see. And basically the only difference between this and the expected positive exposure is that these means divided by the standard deviations, you make them negative in this negative one. And in the other one, you keep them as positive. Also in this case, you subtract that second expression, whereas in this one you added that second expression. So anyways, I'll show you again a more intuitive way to think about this because these formulas just hurt my brain a little bit. And for my, for me, you know, my, with my limitations, I'll say that this makes more sense to me is to think about it with the weighted average. So I will add uh, or a weighted average of all of the negative values that we have here. So I'll go all the way down to negative one. So we'll multiply and add together with all of these values with this sum product. And there we go, enter. So you'll see that this pretty much matches this. Again, we're missing some things in the left tail. But if you're wondering exactly how this sum product formula actually works, it basically works something like this, where basically we're going to multiply the value by its weight, come up with some value here, then we'll do the next one, and we're going to take this one, where we do the same thing, but we'll add it to the previous one, and then we'll do the same thing here, and we'll do it for all of them, and we're just gonna take a weighted average. So then, once we uh, get all of these values, we can just sum up every one of those values, and that would be this value right here. Now we can see over on our bell curve distribution, we have plotted our mean right here with this orange line. So our 5% just sits at the peak of that bell curve. That's our most likely outcome. Then we can see that we're plotting our expected positive exposure right here, which is our basically around 7%. That's this dark green line right here that sits just to the right of the mean. And we've also plotted our expected negative exposure, ENE, which is just below 0%, so a little bit further left of the mean than that expected positive exposure was to the right with this light blue line here. Now let's talk about potential future exposure. So with the potential future exposure at 99%, this is almost like the reverse of a value at risk or VAR calculation, but instead on the right tail. So we're trying to find where is our 99th percentile outcome with this probability distribution. So if you think about VAR, VAR is equal to the mean minus the uh, z-score times the standard deviation. So in this case, that's it's the same, but we basically do plus. So this norm s in of that confidence level just gives us the z-score. So for a right tail test of a z-score at a 99% confidence interval, that's gonna be that 2.33, and I'll show you right here by evaluating this formula, we'll see that this norm s in turns into that 2.33 z-score if you round that, right? So it's gonna be equal to the mean plus the z-score multiplied by that standard deviation. So we're taking it uh, 2.33 standard deviations above the mean, which gives us this PFE at 99%. Then the, PF, the PFE or the potential future exposure at 1%, is like it's literally basically what var would be because it's the same as the pfe at the 99 percent the only thing we change is that in that norm s in function we take one minus the alpha so instead of it being a z-score of 2.33 it's going to be a z-score of negative 2.33 so then we're going to be doing the mean plus negative 2.33 times the standard deviation so we're trying to find that 2.33 standard deviations below the mean, which would literally be the same as our one percentile VAR basically. And so we can see our 
PFE at 1% is represented by this purple line here, whereas that potential future exposure at the 99% is represented by this green line all the way out in the right tail all the way over here. And then finally, the last thing I really wanted to talk about quickly is the expected exposure EE, whereas in this case, because we're looking at a point in time snapshot of everything, the expected exposure we're only going to care about in this counterparty uh, credit risk scenario is if the values are positive because that's when we have credit exposure. If the values or the returns end up being negative, we don't have credit exposure because actually in that case, we owe the counterparty money. So we only care about when it's positive because that's the case when they owe, the counterparty owes us money. So in this point in time snapshot view, this expected exposure is going to be equal to that expected positive exposure EPE. Now, if we looked at this over the course of a life of an asset where we did it over certain periods of time or years, then these could be different values. Thank you for watching this video. Like I said earlier, if you'd like to download this file for free, check out the link in the pinned comment or the description. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to John Gregory who wrote the book Counterparty Credit Risk, which was helpful for me in forming all these calculations. So thank you so much for watching. If you'd like more content just like this, please subscribe to the channel. I'll see you on the next video.